one, one sec. It was sure. A, okay, I'm, I'm going to go back on again. Okay, I'll stop. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. Um, had a bit of an issue there, but I think we have got it all sorted out now. Um, if someone in the on YouTube can just uh, type and let me know. So, okay, great, thanks, guys. Yeah, so welcome everyone um, to uh, the Hibiscus Coast Astronomical Society meeting. Sorry about all that. Uh, in the beginning, we've got a little bit of uh, issues, but I think we've got them sorted out. Uh, so we're going to kick off with Josh. He will be doing the news again. <laughs> um, and then uh, we'll move on to our main presentation, which uh, is uh, Heratina and Sam. Uh, for many of you, you know know them from uh, their previous talk, uh, but uh, there might be some of you who have not met them before, and you are in for a really good treat. So we'll be having a look at SLU, uh, something I've been quite interested in getting involved with as well, um, and then we'll go from there. So we're going to kick it off with uh, Josh. Uh, so if he pops his video on, and... Uh, Go ahead, Josh. Cool. Thanks, James. Hi, everyone. I'm Josh. And before we start the main presentation, I'll just be running through some interesting news stories in terms of astronomy and space-related news, just things that have been happening recently. So, astronomy news. What's been happening above us? NASA is investigating an air leak in the International Space Station. Now, this leak was discovered last year, September 2019, but they determined there's no threat to the crew and it wasn't urgent enough to fix at the time. So I was doing some research into this and I discovered that the International Space Station, apparently it's not 100% airtight. They try their best, but uh, small amounts of air are lost over the weeks and months that are then sort of topped up with other missions. But this, so, so that having an air leak isn't necessarily unusual, but this one, it's leaking a bit more than they would like. So now they're finally getting around to having a look into it. So what they're doing is over the last week or so, they've been sort of shutting hatches to each of the modules so that ground control can monitor the pressure in each one, just to try to determine where the actual leak is coming from. It must be quite difficult if you imagine you know, so many different chambers and modules, how do you work out where the air is escaping from? So what that means is uh, recently, some of the US astronauts have had to camp out in the Russian segment while they do some testing on the, the US side, shutting down modules and things like that. And is an interesting photo of astronaut Chris Cassidy sleeping in his sleeping bag and he's inside the Russian airlock. I feel a bit sorry for him, like they had no other room to put him, so they just sort of shoved him into the airlock with all the other stuff. Must be quite cramped. But yeah, so the, the investigation continues as to where the, the air leak is coming from and to see if they can fix that up. Also in the news, a, a new report warns of the growing risk of satellite mega constellations. Now, in our meetings, we've mentioned in the past the, the, space Inc, the SpaceX Starlink satellites. Maybe you've seen them or, or heard of them. So um, there are currently 655 of these satellites and SpaceX plans in total to launch 12,000. And all these satellites are basically part of SpaceX's plan to deliver high-speed internet to rural and remote areas. Now, Amazon is getting in on the business as well. They're, they're launching their Kuiper project, which will also have a constellation of 3,236 satellites. So there's going to be a lot of satellites up there. And recently, there was a, a workshop to discuss this, and researchers basically warned of the, the impact this has to optical astronomy. I mean, already a lot of us have, have noticed you know, if, if you look up and you see the Starlink satellites, 
they can look very pretty, but if you're trying to do any sort of observation, they can sort of get in the way. So this workshop has released a paper with some recommendations as to what the world, what we can do to combat this. They recommend darker satellites. Now, this is something that SpaceX has already started doing with Starlink. They've started actually painting the satellites a, a darker color or shading the reflective surfaces. This report also recommends better image processing software. So their suggestion is, hey, if this is gonna be the future, if we're just gonna to have to put up with all of these things whizzing around, then it's in the best interest of all of us for us to look into ways to solve this with image processing. Maybe we need to speed up the development of, I don't know, something like artificial intelligence within the image editing that can look at a picture and detect, oh, that's probably a trail from a satellite. I'll remove that automatically, that sort of thing. And the other thing that they recommend is to have more freely available information about the satellite's orbits so that astronomers can point their telescopes away from them. Makes sense. So these are just some of the recommendations, but uh, this is a growing area of concern for a lot of us. So something to keep an eye on in the future. New study shows that a supernova may have caused one of Earth's mass extinction level events 360 million years ago. So most of us know, obviously, that you know, the dinosaurs were wiped out uh, 65 million years ago, but that wasn't the only extinction level event on Earth. Throughout Earth's history, there have actually been five massive extinction events where a vast majority of the life on planet Earth was wiped out by some catastrophe. So with the dinosaurs one, we're you know, pretty sure that we know what caused that, but with the other ones, it's a, a bit up in the air. But this new study suggests that one of these extinction events, the end Devonian one, was caused by a supernova 65 light years away. So remember a supernova is when a star reaches the end of its life and it explodes and blasts a lot of radiation out into space. The topic of supernovas has been in the news recently because Betelgeuse over the last year or so has had some unusual dimming. If you recall last year for a while, it was growing dimmer and dimmer. And we were wondering, hey, is this getting close to supernova? We actually witness supernova in our, in our lifetimes. So for reference, Betelgeuse is 600 light years away. If that went supernova, then there would be no harm to us. But this particular one in the study, that they, they think this may have been 65 light years away. That's definitely close enough to cause havoc here on Earth. So the problem is that the radiation from supernova could damage Earth's ozone layer. And this new study says that this could have caused damage to the ozone layer that lasted 100,000 years. So that could definitely uh, cause problems. So interesting look at our history and also a reminder of, you know, just the, the life that we have here on Earth, we take for granted, but there's all sorts of uh, cosmic uh, catastrophes out there that could, you know, spell disaster for us. Also in the news, astronomers have bounced a laser off a spacecraft orbiting the moon. So I thought this was pretty cool. So I did a bit of reading into this. So what you might not know is that when astronauts were on the moon in 1969, they left some reflectors on the surface of the moon, basically left some mirrors on there. The reason is that researchers can sometimes use this to measure the distance between the Earth and the moon. Because if you think about it, if you get a really high powerful laser and point it at this reflector on the moon, you can measure the amount of time it takes for the laser to get to the moon and then bounce back. So that's old news, that's, that's been done before. But what's new is that uh, to 2009, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or, or R, LRO, uh, was launched and it had a reflector on board with the intention that we might be able to bounce lasers off of that as well. But for almost a decade, there was no success with that. However, a new paper reports that the first successful laser contact was made by a lunar laser ranging station in France, first in September 2018 and August 2019. So this isn't necessarily uh, something that's just happened, but we're just finding out about it now due to the, the paper being published. 
So what's interesting about this is it's the first time that we've managed to bounce a laser off uh, a spacecraft that is orbiting the moon. It must be much more difficult, if you'll imagine, trying to hit sort of a, a moving target. Now, you might be thinking about this, thinking, well, if there's like just a, a flat mirror on the moon or on the spacecraft and the light hits it, wouldn't it sort of bounce off like in a different direction? It's not necessarily going to come back to us on Earth. Well, apparently these reflectors are what are called corner cube mirrors. So the idea is that it's sort of like three panes of, of a box with mirrors on there. And as you can see in this diagram, what this means is no matter what direction the light hits, if it hits one of those faces, it will then sort of bounce onto the other faces and end up going back the way it came, which is pretty cool. I'd, I'd never heard of these things before. So this is the, the type of reflector that we have on the moon. And then we also have on this LRO spacecraft. And this is what we've used to bounce lasers back to Earth. Also in the news, gas clouds mysterious gamma ray signal beats in time with neighboring black hole. So this is a bit of an interesting one. A gamma ray signal was detected from a gas cloud, which has the catchy name of Fermi J1913-0515. So we sometimes detect these gamma ray signals. It's nothing out of the ordinary. It could be from a, a pulsar or a quasar, something else that's just releasing these sort of uh, bits of radiation. But what's interesting is that 100 light years away from the gas cloud is a microquasar. Now, a microquasar, if you recall, is a, a black hole that is very close to a companion star, and it's sort of sucking all of the matter from the star and then spitting it out in sort of two uh, in two different directions. This particular quasar sort of wobbles a bit as well. So what it means is the beams that are going out aren't just straight lines, they end up being sort of spirals. In this artist's impression, the idea is this is the microquasar, so we can see it sort of beaming out this energy in a bit of a, a, a spiral, and this is the, the gas cloud. But what's interesting is that the microquasar sways with a period of 162 days. So it's very reliable every 162 days. And this same pattern has been observed in the gamma ray signal from the gas cloud. So these things are 100 light years away, and the quasar isn't even pointing at the gas cloud, but somehow there's some connection there, there's some link that so far we haven't been able to explain. Why is it that this signal from the gas cloud beats in the same time, the same rhythm as the microquasar? So further observations are required to determine this link. So this could be a, a new phenomenon that we haven't seen before, or there could be some other explanation for them. Haven't found yet. Finally in the news, a submarine could explore Titan's seas. So in recent talks, we've been talking about the uh, Mars Perseverance rover, which has a little helicopter drone in there as well. So in the future, we're, we're going to see helicopters on Mars. So why not submarines on Titan? So Titan is a moon around Saturn. It's the second largest moon in the solar system. And what's interesting about Titan is it's the only world other than Earth to have stable liquid on the surface. It has seas of methane and ethane. Some of the other moons in our solar system have water, but they're underneath a hard surface of ice. Whereas on, on, on Titan, it's, it's, uh, it's liquid at the surface. So this has prompted some researchers to suggest that in future, there might be a mission to Titan with a submarine so that we can explore the, the seas. So uh, for now, this is just a, a concept that has, this hasn't been approved or funded yet by NASA, but the researchers say that if this does get approval and funding, then this could be operational within the 2030s. So we might have to wait a while to see a submarine. And the thinking is that uh, if the submarine works well on Titan, if it allows us to explore the depths, then we can look at some of the other moons like Europa and Enceladus, which also have water. But these moons are, uh, uh, stop sharing here. 
Okay, it looks like we might have a few issues going on with the connection. Um, let's just see what happens. There we go. Yeah, so sorry if there's a little bit of a uh, sort of a lag there. It looks like we had some connection issue, but uh, we're back to normal by the look of it. Yeah, thank you, Josh, for that. Um, you know, if you uh, just join us, welcome again. Um, we will we'll soon be um, having a chat with uh, uh, Sam and Heratina. Uh, if you have been following our posts, uh, you will know uh, tonight's actually a brilliant night out there. Uh, pop out, have a look uh, for Jupiter and Saturn, and of course uh, near the Moon. Um, amongst all the other things that I wrote about in that previous post, uh, most of them uh, you should still be able to see. Um, so there you go. So um, if we just get uh, uh, Sam and Harry to pop their video on, uh, we will soon pop over to them. Excellent. And uh, just pop your audio on as well. Here we go. Excellent. Well, thank you guys for coming along. Um, yeah, we really enjoyed your last uh, talk and uh, really looking forward to, to this one. Um, so um, the guys are at uh, the Phoenix Astronomical Society, uh, uh, based out at Stonehenge, Aotearoa, um, and they're on their mobile. So if you have a look, it might be a little bit jumpy every so often. Uh, that will be the connection, but uh, it shouldn't really distract from the talk. So without any further ado, I will hand over to Heratina and Sam. Well, hello everyone, and uh, thanks for having us. Uh, thanks, James, um, for inviting us back. Um, we're going to mainly talk about uh, SLU tonight, um, which is something that we've been um, uh, we've been having a good look at over the last uh, month or so, um, using telescopes in the Canary Islands and in Chile. So um, we're just going to sort of take everybody through uh, a little bit about SLU, what it is, um, the capabilities of the telescopes, where they are and what they do and so on. Um, and then hopefully do a little bit of a demo. There's, there's one telescope up at the moment, which is actually looking at the sun, which was, which will be <laughs> which is quite, quite good at, you know, nearly 8pm 8, 8 in the evening. <laughs> but it's the sun in the, in the Canary Islands, of course, the same sun we all look at. But, um, and just so to say, we're, we're saying this before to uh, James, hi everyone, that between the two of us, we now have eight telescopes at home and we still love to look through slow. Like we've been so hooked by, by this uh, experience because I can't call it any, any other way. It's like having um, another eight telescopes. Yeah, it, it's phenomenal. So that's what we wanted to share with you. And like James mentioned, we're, we're um, talking from Stonehenge, Aotearoa. Where it's cloudy. Where it's cloudy. So <laughs> we're, we're hoping to do some imaging of Jupiter and Saturn tonight, but that won't be happening. <laughs> so make the most of it if you've got no cloud. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just um, start a little uh, PowerPoint um, presentation that I've got on here. Yeah. And, and then we're going to go online and have a look at the program itself. So there's the SLU, the, the two locations, uh, one in the Canary Islands, uh, just off Africa in the, in the Atlantic Ocean. And, and this, this group of telescopes, it's in, it's in where there's a whole bunch of other telescopes. Um, this is the main, the main large telescopes, and then the SLU one's just over here. Well, you'll just see my little mouse going around, but it's on the right-hand side. Um, I've got, uh, at that location, five telescopes. Well, six, six actually, but two, two of them are piggybacked together. There's uh, Canary One, which is a, a big 500mm uh, uh, plane wave CDK20. Uh, there's a CDK17 as well, um, which is 430 mils, and that's uh, piggybacked with, a, with an 85mm um, refractor. Uh, for wide field views of the same thing that that, that one's looking at. Um, there's also a, a 280 mil uh, Schmidt astrograph and a Celestron Edge uh, 1400 as well. And they've also got a solar telescope, uh, which is the one that's uh, going at the moment. So we'll have a look at that shortly. 
Um, the other, other locations of Chile, and this is uh, a little way outside of Santiago, um, in a, quite a dark uh, spot there. And they've got a, a Celestron uh, Edge 1400 as well, and a Plane Wave uh, CDK, and uh, and another and another edge as well. So they've got two two 1400 edges there. So um, pretty capable cell, um, telescopes, um, certainly better than the ones we've got. <laughs> um, and of course, these telescopes uh, you can use. So you can task them to look at whatever you want to look at. Um, you, you can uh, look at planets, you can look at galaxies, clusters, whatever you like, uh, in the both northern sky and the southern sky. So we've been, uh, well, Harry's obviously done a lot of astronomy in the northern hemisphere. I've done a little bit over a couple of years. So we've been spending the last month or so reacquainting ourselves with the, the northern sky and some of those objects that uh, we haven't seen for you know over a decade. So it's kind of quite nice to see some of those. Um, and, I've, and I've got some pictures that we've, we've taken. Um, this was the um, uh, M103 in, in Canary uh, 1. And on the left-hand side there, there's a little bit about the camera. Um, and then some of the data on, on how the processing is done on the images. So we've just got the, the most, um, I think we've got the middle account. So you can't actually do a whole lot of um, um, adjusting. Yeah, you can't do simultaneous um, the taskings and, and it's limited on what you can do on the processing. So if you if you have the um, all singing, all dancing astronomer account, then you can uh, get the fits files. You can also um, just you know get them raw without any pre-processing. Uh, but our account hasn't got that, so we have to put up with a bit of the um, pre-processing presets that are set by SLU. And they and they the presets are pretty good. Um, they sort of base them um, on on how they think the cameras and the telescopes will perform on a 1,000 different objects. And of course, if you're looking at anything other than those 1,000 objects, um, then, then you get a bit more flexibility. Um, but, that, but that one came out quite well. Uh, Canary 2, this, this is one of um, Beta Tauri, which is a lovely star, which is what was quite cool, so it's okay that one. And again, you know, they've got quite good um, high-end cameras. <clears throat> um, the solar telescope, um, and then hydrogen alpha, it's a double stacked uh, LUNT, so it's a pretty good telescope. A bit uh, bigger than my PST. <laughs> Not too much bigger though, so it's all right. And Canary 4, Old El Barreo, and uh, it's an amazing I, little I love double. the star, it's just so amazing. Yeah. And one of my absolute favorites in the whole universe. And then Chile. So M14, well, it's not M14. <laughs> Whoops, I forgot to change it. Um, I can't remember what globular cluster that was. <laughs> it's definitely not the Eagle Nebula. <laughs> and M50 um, on the Chile 2. So these are kind of kind of a sample of what you can um, what you can um, take pictures of. Now I'll just go to the actual web interface so you can have a have a look. Um, where was it? That one. So we'll just go and have a look at the um, Canary 5. So can you see? Can you see these are up? Yeah, everything's good. <laughs> cool. So there's a live picture of the sun right now um, on, the, on the Canary 5 solar telescope on, there in the Canary Islands. Um, unfortunately, the Chilean telescope's not going. They've got cloud, a bit like what we've got here at um, Stonehenge out here. <laughs> um, the Canary telescopes, um, they have pretty good weather. I think they have 80% um, availability. Um, the, the ones in Chile are a, bit, a little bit less. They're around 65%. Um, so, you know, obviously the, the Canary Island ones are, are going, going the most. And um, with these telescopes, you just um, watch the um, whatever it is on the screen in real time. Mm. So that's the only. With the other telescopes, you can program the computers to take a picture for you, and then you can go to sleep and you wake up. And if you're lucky and it's not cloudy, the next day you see the picture in your um, picture folders. Whereas with this one, you have to have some live action, which is kind of cool. Yeah. So um, we can. We can task one now, actually, because um, 
I don't think I've got any active tasks. Um, I'll have mm. a look at my uh, my missions to be able to see what I've been um, photographing lately. Um, I've got Centaurus A's up. Oh, Bano Star, I got that one. Oh, that's good. Right, so what I can do is um, give you a demo on how you can. So they have the SLU 1000, um, which is a thousand different objects. Uh, if, you, if you go to the high end account, then you can also basically look up anything you like. Uh, but but they, this one thousand, although you can look up anything you like anyway, um, but you just get the, the different processing. Um, what should we look? What should we touch? Um, what would off. you like? What would you guys like? James, what do you reckon? James, what should we get a picture of? Okay, any suggestions <laughs> in the channel? <laughs> now, there's a bit of a lag uh, with that, so <laughs> we might not show yeah, anything. Um, How about a globular cluster? Yeah, globular cluster. There we go. Um, what if what what will be out in Chile at the moment? Um, and there's like a M13 was a lot. Um, anything in Scorpius? Oh, what what what? Uh, forty seven to Yeah, forty seven to uh, That would be a good one. Or Omega Centauri, if they can see that from oh, there. Yeah. Uh, I suggest Omega Centauri because a, a number of our, our viewers here um, saw the post I wrote the other day, and I was saying oh. that they could see it through. Um, Binoculars, so it could be quite mm -hmm. quite nice. Oh, it looks like the chilly one uh, can't see it. Can't so, see it at the moment. Yeah. So, right. so forty-seven Takano. That's that will be the next one. Um, I have also mentioned this a number of times in my posts. Yeah, and you can also see this through binoculars. Oh yeah, it's um, beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. So um, yeah, as I mentioned in my post. Nice pair of binoculars. Um, have a look at that globular cluster. It's absolutely stunning. So 47 Takana is one of the good ones. So, so all you have to do. So there we go. We've got it. We've got it sitting there. It's um, up for at a five past five, and that's um, in Greenwich Mean Time. So what's that in the afternoon? Well, ours is uh, five uh, five p.m. in the afternoon because it's UTC. Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So. 5 p.m. in the in the afternoon uh, on now. Friday, so we'll schedule that mission. There we go. We're we're going on a mission to 47.2, and it gives you a little bit of details about the object, so you can you can read some more about it. Um, you can explore. We can click that. See what it tells us all about it. There it is. A picture of it. Taken through one of the SLU uh, telescopes. The beautiful thing about the SLU pictures is that you can use those pictures anytime, yep. as long as you keep that logo on it and, and just, have just give credit. So yeah. you can use them for presentations, for schools, for anything you want, which I think is phenomenal because these are almost professional grade photographs if you're into astrophotography and even just for regular talks at the library and they're still fantastic. So they tell you when the um, different objects um, that you might be interested in taking photos of, when they're visible from, you know, each of the sites. So in Chile, um, 47 is visible April to um, in March, so nearly all year round. And Canary Islands, of course, it's not visible at all. So um, <laughs> good job they put the um, telescopes in Chile so we can get some southern hemisphere objects. So uh, how much how much do these accounts cost? Well, we'll get to that in a second. Um, the other thing that they have in here, they have um, Burnham's Celestial Handbook, which probably everybody knows about it, that it's on this call. And they have all these um, quotes from it. And so you can go and learn in depth um, about all, all these objects in here. Um, so just to, to answer your question really short, quickly, and then we can go into um, a more in-depth. Um, so there's two types of subscriptions. One is for just individuals like we are, yeah. Yeah. but you can also join us a club. Now, joining us a club means that you have to find um, 30 people or 150 people or 1,000 people. These are the tiers. So for, so I can, um, Maybe show you here.
And so it's very cool to join as a group. So this is the slow page that we made on our Milky Way Kiwi Star Safari. And it is join us a club. So we'll just do the join us a club, which is this. So it comes up to 25 a year, $25 a year, which is like nothing, almost like um, $20 a year if you have 150 people or uh, $15 per person per year and you get um, your massive <laughs> club, like a school or, or anything like this. And the point, I guess the point of these clubs is so the memberships on these are the, um, the basic membership. So you, yeah. you don't get a whole lot of flexibility with the So the one, the, um, where's the individual one? Yeah. So if you're, if you're really into like astro imaging and, and stuff, um, you know, we, we, we're um, apprentice members. So we've got this one, which is 150 um, a year. Um, so you get, um, you get one mission at a time that you can task, and but you can also piggyback on other people's missions. So if there's someone say, taking a picture of uh, M13 and you want to also have a picture of M13, you could jump on their task and you'll also get um, the picture. So you can you can load up a whole pile of tasks. I think about 10, I think. Yes, yeah, about yeah. 10. So you can schedule your own mission. Just You can only just schedule one at a time and you have to wait until the picture is taken and then mm. go and take it again. But you have up to 10, like if you go, and I'll show you... Um, how to to do this like for instance if you want to do a quest and you need to look for a certain object the computer automatically looks for who else is taking the picture of that object so one of the fun things about um slew is that we're um it's gamified so everybody's kind of like playing so sam and i have been competing how many points we have he's now leading right. with about two thousand points how many badges do you have yeah um well, yeah, that, I mean, that's, this is it. That's, um, um, and if you're an astronomer, I think this is the power user and you can schedule missions. And so what people do with that one is they, they'll take uh, multiple images of the same object. Like um, uh, last night, there was someone taking, uh, we just there was like someone taking a whole lot of photos of IC342 that um, really didn't um, face on beautiful spiral galaxies. It's visible to the northern hemisphere. Um, and they took quite a few images. So what they would have done would be downloading the um, fixed files in uh, Luminance and RGB and then processing them themselves. Um, so that's the flexibility you get um, with, the, with the more expensive account as you can use the telescopes. Um, and with the cheaper accounts, you're obviously on the presets and stuff, so you have less flexibility. Yeah, and what mm. we also need to mention as well, which is uh, on the screen there, is that we are... Milky Way Kiwi, we're supporting SLU with content and expertise, and we want to develop a few quests for New Zealand yeah, as well. Yeah. That'll be really awesome. And we're very excited, you can imagine. It's like, it's like cool, yeah. being in a candy shop, yeah, yeah. literally. <laughs> yeah. And um, so they have they have these uh, quests. Um, I think I'll look at one I'm doing. Um, so I'm collecting all the messier objects at the moment. <clears throat> Right here, this is the messier challenge. And you get to, you know, collect collect them all. Um, I've got a bunch of them. Obviously, I've got all the ones that I can get at the moment. Um, but this this is quite cool. So, little Trifford. Um, M16. Oh, I thought it was M14, it was M16. Mm. <laughs> Maybe it was M14. Mm. No, it was M14. There you go, I confused myself. Mm. He's easily done. <laughs> um, there's dumbbells, it's a pretty dim dumbbell. One of the one of the highlights of Planetary Nebula in the in the northern sky, really, really beautiful one. So you can do these uh, quests where you go through and just get, um, like on this one, all, all the messier objects. I've, I've done all these in the last um, about a month. Once you have everything, I'm just going to scroll down really fast. 
I've done quite a lot of work on this one. Only got, got 49 to go, I think. <laughs> the, the dumbbell galaxy, it looks like a, a, like a soap bubble. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, like, and then at the end you can download the poster. Um, so it's your own poster. You know, the, you know those posters that you can buy from the shop with the things with the exact design? They can have your own. Well, so, you know, well, they, they don't yeah. do all the work for you. You've still got to um, take into consideration, you know, the, um, the altitude of the object, um, the, all the weather conditions and everything. So it's a, quite, a, quite a few of the um, ones I've taken, I probably could have picked a, a, yeah. a better time of the evening or better conditions to get, you know, a, a better image. So it's, it's all those sort of considerations that you, you kind of have to do. So you can plan your, your yeah, um, but, images quite well. But while we were talking just before about planning a mission and uh, when you um, when you want to have a mission, then you can lead one, but then you can piggyback on other people's um, missions to find images. So like, for instance, we just take this one. I've just picked out one, um, M86, for instance, and we say, find image. And here it goes, no vision, no problem, schedule a mission and capture some images um, and then make sure to come back here to continue your quest. So they make you work, they make you upload stuff. So that's quite cool. And now we just click in here to see if there is any mission coming up to photograph this. There's nothing. But no, I mean, yeah, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> proving a point. But if there was a mission, you could have piggybacked on someone else's uh, someone else's missions and what i wanted to also show is like the very first one the very very first quest that everybody has to do there's these three quests um it's called cosmic explorer and it's quite a cute one uh, and and they give you points so every single quest gives you points and if you share there's like this amazing community that you you've got there these are the people um who are online right now and you can talk to them you've got um chat if you have your own club you can chat with the people in your own in your own club so, so these are the the steps of the first mission for instance and this is like extraordinary for just a beginner so they get you to take images of the moon the sun a dying star another galaxy a red supergiant and a neo nebula and they teach you what every single one is and so these are sam's images which i mean they're absolutely gorgeous um that's what it was that day Yeah, but these are unprocessed images. So like you just you just get them from the but then you can process them if you want. So a lot of people process images and they just uh, uh, check them back and they, they they talk to each other about processing and everything. So that was one step one. And then the step two, they teach you about the moon. So um, there's a lot of information in here on how the moon formed. And it's like really what we love about it is that it is a truly a online astronomy course, but it's hands on. And, you know, everybody gets to take a picture of the moon. Yes, you take it through a computer, but you take it in real time and you schedule your mission. So they make you work for it. So then you feel like you're doing something, you know, and, and one day, maybe when you have enough money to buy those telescopes, to take your own picture. And this is how I feel. I can't wait for us to do a cover observatory to go and retake all these pictures ourselves. Yeah, yeah. So see, there's like a lot of stuff to learn um, about the sun and about the moon. And I'm just browsing through here. I'm not sure if um, you guys can see. So I've got a quest question here from John Drummond. Um, he, oh, hi, John. Uh, <laughs> he was uh, asking, what is the typical exposure times on with these photos? All right, yeah. So, I mean, that, that, that's a good question. So, um, and I, I wrote them down what the presets were um, for, for us. So, here's one here, this uh, M103. The presets for an open cluster on the Canary One with that camera is uh, they do automatically do three by three binning and then a three by 60 second luminance and then one, one by 50 seconds of each of uh, red, green, and blue. So that's um, so the account we have, which is just the middle one, um, we, we're kind of stuck with the presets. Um, if we shell out a bit more, we can um, get the astronomer account, and then we can um, have a lot more flexibility, and you can set your um, your own um, exposures. So I imagine they probably have some some limits to that, but you probably can't go and do it for an hour. 
but um, but I imagine there's a you know there's a bit of flexibility there. You can probably schedule a lot of them throughout the year and yeah. keep taking yeah. them. Yeah. Now I've seen some like because they have uh, like a chat or uh, like a forum um, thing on there as well, and you see people posting different pictures where they've um, combined their own data that they may have taken or they've taken or they've got a whole lot of data they've collected over a month or so which they combine. It's quite cool. They also do um, seem some really interesting um, just little videos of uh, Jupiter and its moons. Um, people have been making uh, those because mm. they, they have some of the um, planetary stuff as well, which is quite, quite good. Um, I'll show you my, I, I did some photos of the um, planets this morning. And we think this is really amazing for schools as well because these beginner quests, they, they have all about the solar system and also they have the life cycle of a star and, and our place in the universe. And it kind of like we, we sat down and got, went through what it covers in terms of New Zealand curriculum and even Marautanga or Aotearoa. And it does cover quite a lot. And probably anybody from up to the age of 12 um, would find it very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. The planetary ones, they're not using a, a video camera. They're just straight off the... Um, the CCD camera that they've got on the on the Canary Four telescope. So unlike the Sun one, which has got a, a video camera going, so collecting all the frames. So that's not bad from one frame. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, you could have a look and see the you could see the Sun one, uh, yep. and that was live. Uh, can you ha have a look at like the other telescopes as they taking photos? Around? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you totally can. When they're yeah. open, that's what you do. You just go there, and um, there is a green dot next to the telescope, and you can see what other people are are taking pictures of. And you can see at the moment there's all this lovely cloud over the um, Chile One or the Chile Telescope. Hence why they haven't got it open tonight. When people take live pictures of the of the night sky, you can actually jump on their mission, and if you happen to be there, you can yourself take pictures, or you can um, show show your pictures. That's what you said. No, I don't remember. Here's um here's the queue for the Canary One when it comes on. So you've got um you know someone's doing the uh, M5, and then there's uh, I see four six zero three. Um, M102, Pluto, NGC 6906, so on, so on, so on. So a big long list. Um, There's a lot of people who do near Earth objects. There's a, a, someone who did a comet, Helix Nebula. took a, a picture of the comet near the Pleiades. That was a fantastic picture, and he, um, he was talking about it. So it's a lot of research that is going on as well. Yeah, it's quite a bit they're doing there. Yeah. yeah. I think um, so. Then uh, just even tomorrow on Canary One, there's a whole lot of um, uh, blank slots still available. So, so generally, whenever you task it, you, you're getting a, you're getting your image within a couple of days. And of course, that uh, depends on the, the weather. Um, so if you get one of the Canary, well, if you get on the Canary telescopes, mm -hmm. and the weather's pretty good. There's a whole lot of empty ones there. So I can, I can only do the one mission. So otherwise, I can't lock in. Lock in the Unless you're looking for something through a quest, which um, allows you to, to jump on 10 pictures and then mm. wait for them. And so we've had a lot of fun taking a whole lot of uh, pictures. Um, A really bad horse head. <laughs> so just like um, you know, imaging yourself, you do have to think about your target. And you've got to think about the conditions, and, and of course, um, think about which telescope you're using because um, you know to get the right uh, image scale and everything. So you can totally um, overexpose them if you're using the um, using the wrong wrong equipment. And, um, and here, for instance, there is uh, one of the quests. Um, it's about the midnight culmination of the Pleiades. You don't know? No, I don't know. Um, 
You don't have it in here. Oh. 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 Um, I'm just going to do a search. Okay, another question that came up. Uh, how far out are the time slots typically booked? Uh, do you have to reschedule a few days out normally, or is it the same day? Um, well, as we saw just from that list on the Canary One, there were time slots available um, the next time it's open. So that'll be, you know, tomorrow during the day. Um, our time, there's a whole bunch of slots that are open at the moment. So, so if you went on there and um, started, you know, booking now, you'd, you'd, you'd get Canary One and probably, well, they all seem to have vacant slots within the next sort of 24 hours. Um, but of course, if the if the telescope's closed um, and, you know, your slot isn't then no longer available, so you have to rebook, um, you know, it's sort of dynamic like that. If, if, you, if you don't get it because of the weather, then you've got to give it another go. It doesn't automatically um, rebook it for you. I think actually, I think the longest we had um, wanted to get a picture of Neptune, and that was um, I think that took about two days to um, to get there. I'm hearing a oh, girl on, on Canary Four um, telescope because that was the one they used. Uh, the moon was uh, another one because you can only take some phases of the moon. So, um, so here is an example of this. Um, techniques that they, they're also teaching. So they say, okay, take a picture of the Pleiades, but take a picture when they are um, a meridian. So then they give you here all the details and you have to take a picture an hour before and an hour after when it um, reaches its highest altitude. Um, and so like, it's pretty awesome because it, it really shows you by doing a quest and you can't go for, further unless you do the quest. Um, it shows you directly, or actually makes you take a picture of the object when it's lower on the horizon and higher on the horizon in a favorable position. So then you can compare, and then you absolutely know that you have to have the object in a perfect location position and so on. So that was like quite an easy one and a shortcut. And you know, I wish I, I had this done years ago, right? Um, and it tells you, and for every telescope in here, so you've got different telescopes, um, they tell you what what you can, um, at what time it happened, and oh, my just press the telescope. Um, but it says, when are they visible and, and uh, what telescope to, uh, um, to see. So in here, you know, I mean, I, they teach you all this stuff. So basically this is a, an astronomy manual online. Um, we're very excited about taking this to schools first and foremost. It's a huge educational, it's a huge educational opportunity for, for every everybody, but for them as well. I mean, imagine all these kids doing that, but even people like us, maybe not like John Drummond, because he's taking pictures of everything in the sky, right? <laughs> uh, but the rest of us can, um, I highly recommend it. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Have you got any uh, other questions, James? So are there any other questions out yeah. there? Uh, just pop them into the, the live chat over there. Uh, so when are we going to get a slew telescope at um, Stonehenge? At Stonehenge, yeah. yeah. That's, that's right. So, uh, We're working on it. We, we figure at least um, we could have the lowest weather stats. <laughs> <laughs> We're just digging a hole right now. Yeah. Well, we're pretty good. I mean, this, they're going to put telescopes in the UAE. Um, they're hoping by the start of next year. So, with those in the Canary Islands and Chile, it's, uh, it's, it's a good chunk of coverage. Um, you know, over over a 24-hour period, there'll still be a gap, obviously. Um, so, eventually, you know, it'd be really good if we, mm -hmm. we have one in New Zealand. Yeah. Or you know, Australia put one in Western Australia or something like that. It'd be quite good as well. Um, so I assume you guys are actually running a club there. Um, yep. uh, if if uh, any of the listeners uh, want to join up with the club, how do they go about doing that? 
Um, the so, thing if they, is, so if yeah. you join, um, so if you join SLU um, as an individual, then you automatically go into um, the club we've we've got set up for New Zealand. Um, the if you if you if, if a, like an astronomy club wanted to buy its own club, um, so that, that example I think there's 30 members. So what that is like a, a group will buy a club membership, so you get 30 sort of sub members of that club. And you get one administration account, yeah. And so they look after all of the accounts within it, so you can, you know, kind of chop and change them as you know membership changes and so on. And the key, the key thing to remember there though is that those um, those memberships are for the the basic one, they aren't for the more advanced stuff. Um, so yeah, that's probably the, the main thing to remember for those. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a good learning curve, and then people oh, can yeah. go and upgrade and learn the ropes. Because I I wouldn't think that people would learn the ropes in le less than a year, especially with astronomy. Like some people take a lifetime, but a mm. year would be like enough. So then they can they can check it out. Um, however, the the thing about the clubs is that you have to pay up front. So we do want to have a Milky Way Huey club here, but we need to come up with seven hundred and fifty dollars. Um, up front to pay for it and then go and get people who want to subscribe to it and, and do that. So that's that's something that we want to do. But in the meantime, we just do this individual membership. So just going back, uh, the individual membership was at $75 for the year. Yeah, $75 for well, the student or the beginner level and then $150 for the apprentice. That's kind of a regular yeah. user. And then the astronomer is really the power user, so the, the someone who's really going to, you know, be downloading um, the FIPS files um, and doing, you know, wanting to do their own processing, that, that sort of thing. And uh, what is the difference between the beginner level and the, the regular user? Um, so the beginner level, um, you get, um, you can do, like, like the middle one, you can do one, um, uh, one tasking at a time. Um, you can only do a couple of piggyback missions at a time, so you can't sort of just load up about 10 of them. Um, so it's, so each of them is sort of a bit more limited for, for each one. Um, and then you're also restricted just to the SLU 1000 objects. So you, you can't sort of go and pass the telescopes to look at anything other than the SLU 1000. For the middle one, you can go and look at a whole bunch more objects. Um, you can, I think it's about 10, well, I have 10 anyway, on a... Um, piggyback missions and then one task mission from yourself and then the astronomer one is you can pass five um, missions in the same time so yeah that's the same in, time so yeah. that's in the same time so like right now there'll be five telescopes taking pictures for whatever um reason we have so like if we research an asteroid or something like that that would be worthwhile um but if you don't research near objects or comets or anything like that you know um, just for the first year to learn. So that's when you can set up, like you, you could do, you could grab four or five slots in a row and mm. you could set up a bit of an imaging run. Um, and people if, do that. If you had the, um, the astronomer um, pack. Yeah. yeah. And you see that quite often on the on the queue, you'll see someone's got like a, an object that's on for three or four in a row. And that's because they've booked, booked out a bit of a time slot where they're take, taking multiple images. And, and so, oh. and you can set, um, so with the astronomer one, you can set how many uh, luminance margin bands you want. Mm -hmm. um, they, don't, they don't have any narrow band uh, filters set up for, for users at the moment, um, but that could be something that they can do. But right now it's just um, luminance margin bands. Well, that sounds pretty good, that. Um, so uh, for everyone listening, um, if you go to star safari.nz slash slu, uh, you'll be able to uh, join up uh, with one of those uh, uh, levels. Uh, so, yeah. So, what, what else have you guys been up to recently? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, yeah, just so we're also building, um, building our observatory out here. Um, so we've put on a path and been digging holes and generally wearing ourselves out. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, we, we run the stargazing evenings here on our Friday and Saturday nights. So we're just um, putting in a bit more of infrastructure um, to make it a bit more comfortable in winter. So, so people don't get wet feet. Tomorrow we're going to go and buy some wood. Yeah, we're going <laughs> to buy some wood tomorrow. We've got a shed which we're putting up and yeah, been moving yeah. Uh, about 
30 tons of stone. So, yeah. We're good. We're still alive. <laughs> still and alive, then we just, go and just yeah. flew. I mean, it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, getting the telescopes out, having a good look um, when, it, when it's clear um, through the roller coaster of lockdowns. Um, so we've been we've been closed while on lockdown two, um, and we'll, we'll be open again um, pretty soon, hopefully. So a, a, a lot of people here don't know about Stonehenge Aotearoa, where it is, where it is, oh, or oh, what wow. they do, or anything like that. So, uh, well, Stone Stonehenge dash. All right, so Stonehenge um, was built in 2005 um, and it was Richard's whole idea. He used to teach at Cut Observatory with Kay Leather and they had a lot of people, they had a talk called Mysteries of the Night Sky where Richard loves to talk about everything from astronomy to archaeoastronomy. So basically Stonehenge is an archaeoastronomy site, but modern because it's been built in 2005 and uh, completely oriented on um, um, on the coordinates here in uh, in Karshishan. And so he he was teaching this course, and everybody was like, "Ooh, we want to know more about um, all these mystery stone structures from antiquity," because that's what he was uh, at the time. I think that's what he was passionate about. But he's a very accomplished astronomer as well. So he's done a lot of observations and, and research and, you know, it's not just, just archaeoastronomy. Um, so, so people loved it. And then he thought, well, why don't we build a Stonehenge? <laughs> you do, right? So he, um, he went to look for a piece of land and then he founded the uh, Phoenix Astronomical Society along with a few of his astronomy friends. And together as the Phoenix Astronomical Society, they've applied for a Morse grant that was administered by the Royal Society of New Zealand. And they got the grant, and it was a grant for, um, for working um, teams, for, what, what the, for people to work together to, to volunteer for a cause, to create something to do for people. So people came here and worked in a weekend, and they had this, um, and you can read here and about us, there's like the whole story, which is really um, in here, Don Henge. This is Richard and Kay, and this is the Henge in here. Um, and then if you click on this page, Don Henge Aotearoa, you can see um, Professor Alan McDermott, he came and opened the um, Henge at the time and, um, it was an enormous effort from very, very, very many people, which Richard has a really big list and we, and sometimes we, we want to make like a really, really big poster with everybody's names who work here. And um, there was funny like little things what they were saying, like for instance, uh, Bob Adam, he, uh, he's a surveyor and he came here for a whole year and measured every single alignment, every single tiny little star, every single Maori star, um, is the lintels, the pillars, and the lintels are not equal. You're supposed to have them equal normally, but they didn't make them equal so that you can have access to um, to these Maori stars that are so important for uh, for the Maori star lore. And I, I tell you, I've, I've been teaching in a planetarium since 2005, since uh, Stonehenge was open, and I think it's it's so amazing to be in the middle of the Henge and just do astronomy stargazing from the Henge because it's a real live planetarium and it doesn't compare. I know, you know, and I and I do I do operate like a state-of-the-art digital planetarium where you can put pictures and things on the dome and you can speak time forward and it's just like really amazing. But here, just when you are right in the middle of the night, in the middle of the Henge, and, and it's got this beautiful echo because obviously it's a circle. And they were saying like, Right here on top, I don't know if you can see the top lintel, so just this top part of the hinge in here, because what a hinge basically does, it just levels the horizon. So there's like tiny little rods of metal, um, and Richard was saying that they, they wanted to put that because they wanted to um, put um, speakers on top of the hinge if they had concerts, 
And then when they had the first concert, they realized that they don't need a speaker mm -hmm. because yeah. there is natural acoustic of an amphitheater. And it's the same size as the one in, uh, in England, by the way. And also the flyer. So they thought, oh, you know, we don't put uh, speakers. We're just going to put um, light in there, electrical light. And they're like, we don't need electrical light because if you lit up a fire, it just like lits up everything and, and you can see. And there is this one as the obelisk that it marks, it, it casts a shadow on an analemma. So you can come see in here, it casts a shadow at midday and it tells you which star sign um, is happening that day. This stone here is the center and this is a line um, north south and this is a line east west. And then you see all these stones in here. So if you stand in the middle of the, um, I hinge here and you're about the same height as Bob Adam, then at solstice is an equinox as you will see the sun coming out from these stones. So this is winter solstice, it comes from here, makes a circle in the sky and sits in here. Equinox is coming from this stone and then goes on to this stone here and summer solstice is here and it makes a big arch in the sky and then sits on this stone here. And they have different heights because they actually mimic the horizon because they're we're surrounded by a mountain range here. Uh, it's far away, but you can still see it. So it's just really amazing how they combine all this knowledge from from thousands of years ago, but they they just made it into uh, into this modern thing. It's such a jewel. It, I just totally totally love it. And here. This thing here is called uh, the fingers of Mother Earth, and there is a tiny little stone behind. And if you sit, stand on that stone at Matariki, you look through here. This is the through here and here to this pillar here. This is where you actually see Matariki rising on on Matariki time. This is how. This is the entrance. It's just just phenomenal. This is me with the laser pointer, and what I'm pointing at, um, which is out of the picture, it's the that celestial pole right there at nighttime. So yeah, like it's it's so worth, um, we, we're way biased. We think it's so yeah, worth it's being here cool. at nighttime. So these are um, images from when people came here and, and so many people came and helped and worked on this place and, and they've done such an amazing job. And this is like um, uh, Richard with the main, main workers. This is um, uh, Bob Adam who, uh, came here and measured everything. So yeah, just fantastic, fantastic stuff. And this is a um, view of uh, of what's, so we're right here now. We're, we're talking to you from here, from this far, from this building. Um, but it's quite amazing to view the night sky, like standing in, in the middle of the hinge, um, that lintel really separates the ground from the sky. So you could kind of imagine what it must have been like, uh, you know, back years ago when people were you know congregating around these sort of stone circles around the world um they would really get that um appreciation of the night sky and i guess that was you know since you know galileo invented the telescope and we um you know started sticking them in domes um you know prior to that this is what they did you know they didn't have telescopes so they had to have big open areas to observe the night sky and you, and you could just imagine um you know the astronomers of old um, out there in these uh, open air observatories like this, um, you know, look, looking at the night sky, really taking it in. I've been in a star compass as well, Maori star compass, um, many, many years ago when, when they were first building them. I've been in the one in Tauranga. And that is similar kind of uh, feeling to be in there. But I have to say, this is an instrument. This is like, that's an instrument as well, and it's uh, adapted for you know traveling and navigating by the stars. But this one here is really, if you want to learn astronomy and how the stars work and, and everything, just build yourself a Stonehenge. <laughs> <laughs> you, you might need a few acres. So <laughs> the question I've got here is, um, does Stonehenge have a heel stone? Yeah, these are the hill stones here. These ones. Near where the sun sits. At the yeah. Solstice and and it's quite cool actually when you um, observe it setting like on, on the solstice. Uh, I remember in December yeah. last year we watched it. You know, the next day, the, 
the sun appreciably moves just a tiny bit, but yeah. you can, you know, you can see it. Uh, so these things are set up really, really well. Well, yeah. long, long live Bob, because he was, uh, yeah, he he's the hero. Good. Everybody's like praising him. For it. Yeah, Bob did that. <laughs> and Bob did that. Yeah. So uh, for everyone out there, we've actually got uh, Richard Hall um, who will hopefully be speaking to us uh, probably next month, uh, thanks to Harry and Sam going to set that up for us. Uh, he is an absolutely amazing speaker as well, uh, beautiful uh, visual presentations. Uh, so that's going to be a real treat um, to have him as well. So th thanks to you guys for organizing that. Our pleasure. Yeah, we'll, we'll sort them out. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so if a, any of you are down in the wire wrapper and, uh, and sort of the Carterton area, uh, this is definitely a place to go to. I've, I've been there numerous times. Um, uh, the star date um, is also there a couple of times a, a year. And um, I know it's a club we've been talking about uh Going, uh, going down to one of the star dates as, as a club. So uh, if people are interested, oh, cool. we'll yeah. definitely try and organize that. Uh, also quite interesting is, uh, as uh, Harry said earlier, they have concerts there as well. And uh, there was a Pink Floyd tribute band. I've been uh, seen them twice there. Uh, wow. And uh, um, Led Zeppelin tribute band also had a, a concert there uh, so, right. so quite amazing <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a concert on tomorrow night actually there's a, um, some a choir I think choir uh, from Wellington yeah, yeah. wow um, so having a look at that picture I see it's quite old because the, the dome, oh yeah it's dome's... one of the initial pictures yeah there's like nothing in here yeah the hinge is really yeah wide. <laughs> and there's like no these are so big now yeah. So grown, and these are like three times cut and trimmed. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and the telescopes are also all up the big one. Um, these ones here, yeah. So the, yeah. these are the shed of the uh, Phoenix Astronomical Society, and this one is the solar telescope. Um, and this one is still here, unfortunately. Yep, it's in the same position. And this one is still here in the same position. Nothing changed, but I think there is another shed here that. Here. But you can have a look on this website, and it's um, oh, and here is obviously uh, we set up Richard with a blog because he's such an amazing storyteller, and so you've got um, him talking and writing, and um, yeah, so they're all in here. And Richard's style, you know, his presentations are in his blog, and it's just. Uh, yeah, just enjoy the blog. Enjoy mm. Richard. I, I don't. I can't. You know, there's nothing else to say. And obviously, the Mars uh, Mars exhibition. We're making a Mars exhibition. Hopefully, we can open it in um, October, which is extremely exciting. You can play with Mars here. It's a very cool um, um, GIF that we got from NASA website. And yeah, so we're all very excited. It's, a, it's an amazing place to to have a Mars exhibition. Yeah, so uh, if you have a look there, it's got the address and the contact details. Uh, you've scrolled past. <laughs> if you just click on yeah. the con contact there. Um, and, and if you go um, like at the bottom here, um, it's all the details. Like, yeah. <clears throat> so here is the map. This is Carterton. It's about 11 kilometers from. Past the mushroom factory. Oh yeah. yes, you've, you've got to stop off at the mushroom factory if it's open and get the the, the yeah. seconds. Uh, oh my God, you're making past, past past yeah, yeah. yeah, they they cost like three times less than in the supermarket. Yeah. So a lot of those. <laughs> so the, another reason why this location was chosen is um, way back when uh, they were looking for a good observatory for New Zealand. Uh, they looked at two places. One was in the Wairarapa and the other was Mount John. And of mm. course, uh, we know that they went with Mount John. Um, but mm. um, yeah, so it's designated as a potential uh, dark sky reserve. Um, That's uh, right, yeah. And yeah. Harry's on the um, committee for the Wairarapa Dark Sky Association. So 
um, you know, they're working really hard to try and get their um, dark sky reserves. Get people yeah. to turn the lights down. Yeah. So and it's going to encompass all of the Wairapa, which will be quite quite amazing. Yeah. So for, for those of you up here in Auckland, um, of course, you know, we've got our dark sky reserve just off the coast uh, with uh, Great Barrier Island. Uh, which I think was the, the first official dark sky reserve. Uh, so, you know, we're quite spoiled up, up here in Auckland, uh, but uh, Wire Rap definitely is, is uh, worth it. Of course, uh, Stonehenge is far away from all the, the uh, cities and uh, anything of, with great light. I just got that little village, Wellington, nearby. <laughs> Luckily, on the other side of the hill. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, it's a big fence in the way. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah. So if anyone's uh, down there, definitely pop in. Um, I think it's about fifteen dollars uh, entrance yep. Yep. during the day, yep. and uh, of course uh, Friday and Saturday uh, we've got, got uh, the observing uh, that uh, Harry and Sam are running. So yeah. is that free or is that also fifteen dollars? Oh, it's fifteen dollars. Yeah. 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 There we go. So fifteen dollars if you go during the day. Uh, it's quite good uh, if uh, Richard's around. Uh, you get a really good tour. Um, if you go to uh, pre-book tour as well, um, he'll take you through the whole thing. And he is an amazing storyteller. Absolutely amazing. Um, oh yes. Yeah. In, in a month or so, like I say. Uh, We'll have him on. Uh, you guys will uh, see what he's like. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty amazing. So um, looking forward to that. Uh, are there any other questions out there? Uh, just pop it into the, the chat. So uh, what, what are your plans now, sort of, say, within the next year or two uh, at Stonehenge? Well, our, our aim is eventually to have build a science centre out here, a science education centre, you know, based, based on the space sciences. Um, so that's why, you know, we're starting with uh, the telescopes and, and, and stuff and, you know, to build our interest, um, get the local community behind um, mm. the work we do here. And all the money that um, we get here, we put it back into telescopes and building all these facilities and the Mars. For the Mars yeah. exhibition, we had a grant from the Phoenix Astronomical Society and from the United States Embassy. And that was extraordinary because we can actually make something that looks really nice. Yeah. And Ian Cooper and us, we went to uh, Tafia Harbor and got permission from the council over there to, to get uh, red soil, red Mars soil. Yeah, there's not a lot more red soil in New Zealand. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's a great big continent of it um, just over to Tasman, but there's not a whole lot here. So. Um, we drove a thousand yeah, kilometers to get yeah. it. It was you, you, many years ago. You, you must be talking about the West Island. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so West Ian, Island, yeah. Oh, I know where we are. So up in Tafia Harbour. Yeah. Yeah. So we, uh, we did a day trip up there um, with a couple of shovels and Ian Station Wagon. And Parked we, on the side of the road yeah. and just started digging, boy. Yeah. <laughs> we, we had permission. So we, we had we permission, yeah. Up, yeah. Um, so, so we've got this um, very Martian light. So copyrighted. Yeah. <laughs> so so yeah, and um, we think it's you know one of those places that that we can develop into into just not just astronomy but also space science. We we actually dream to have a Mars yard in here where we can do immersive Mars science with schools and mm. everybody else who wants to come and, and learn about Mars because you know like. I really love Mars, <laughs> but then who doesn't? So there are plans. Well, probably not in the next year, but um, yeah, hopefully. no, in the next five years. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. but we're committed to uh, yeah. to come and volunteer here and and do all this. Um, build telescopes. We've been digging holes today. Yeah. So, so yeah, and everything we have, we invest back in science and education and space and astronomy. It'd be really cool to have a you know, massive telescope that people can look at. Um, you know, not, not just have one that's got a camera attached to it, but have the local um, people, people, you know, from other parts of New Zealand or you know, people from Wellington, you know, drive up here and, and look in a really massive telescope. That'd, that'd be cool. Mm. We've, we've, we've um, got one 16-inch telescope here and we've got another one um, coming shortly. So we'll have two 16-inch um, 
reflectors that people can look in. And, but that's, that's good here with a nice dark sky. You can see some pretty cool things. But people are, you know, it's amazing when you, you say to someone, right, how many how many fuzzy blobs can you count in the eye, in the eyepiece? And they'll say, oh, I think I saw seven. And you say, well, you know, they're galaxies. <laughs> you know, each one of them might be a couple of hundred billion stars. And you just see, see their eyes light up, realising, you know, what, what they're looking at. So, you know, it's, it's really cool to be able to share this with, um, with people. And, and make it accessible. You know, that's the big thing for us is we, we the sky should be accessible. And we're really keen on, um, you know, keep, keeping the prices low so that we can, um, you know, get, get a family out here without them having to remortgage their house. Yeah, that's a fantastic place. I'll get a bit of feedback there again. Um, yeah, a fantastic place there. And, um, you know, for anyone who, who's uh, got any good ideas for astronomy, particularly with education, um, you know, the guys uh, down at Stonehenge are very open to um, helping you guys out. And, you know, if you need a spot and it's educational worthy, um, yeah. They, they're very eager to get you involved. So uh, it's really fantastic having um, Stonehenge down there. Um, hopefully we can get something similar up here at some stage. <laughs> um, you know, have a, a, a big, nice uh, centre of astronomy um, at mm. the top of the North Island. Yeah. Um, Why not? I mean, that's, New Zealand is the country of astronomy, isn't it? That's right, yeah. You know, they say uh, astrotourism is going to be a, a big part of our future. So I think it's down to uh, people like uh, everyone out there and us um, mm. you know, getting involved and uh, doing our bit and um, really promoting astronomy uh, in New Zealand. Um, of course, yeah, we, we, we're very lucky here. We, in terms of countries in the world, we, we've got pretty dark skies. Mm. You know, uh, so if even even looking up at uh, on the Hab Habiscus Coast where um, our, our club is based, um, we've got the Radio Club site, which is a pretty dark mm -hmm. sky, and that's in yeah. sort of middle middle of Habiscus Coast. <laughs> so um, yeah, a lot of lot of exciting things happening there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if people if people get the slow uh, membership, the individual one. They have a few sessions of stargazing here at Stonehenge, and if they get the astronomer one, they can come here for free to do stargazing whenever right, they want. Yeah. I mean, well, while we're here, obviously. Yeah. So, so if anybody like they they do get this and happen to come here um, at Stonehenge, just let us know, and uh, yeah. yeah, just let us know you've got the membership, and you, you're very welcome to join us. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, thank you guys uh, so much for uh, coming along and uh, chatting to us about SLU. It's something I've been quite interested in uh, recently as well. So uh, it was uh, very, very well timed. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot for also um, yeah, sort of telling us about Stonehenge. We hope to see you on the other side then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Um, yeah, I don't think there's any more. I don't think there are any more questions over there. Um, so I'm going to say uh, thank you to all the the listeners out there as well. Um, thank you for uh, joining us this evening. Um, in about uh, two weeks' time, we will be having another one of these. Uh, but it will be a members-only one. We have a, a very, very special guest um, all the way from Canada who, uh, who will be doing the talk. Of course, uh, his times are really horrible. I think it's, he's waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning to, to join us for this. Um, uh, so keep an eye on the uh, Facebook page because... Um, that's where we'll be advertising it. And like I say, uh, you will need to be a member of Hubbard's Coast Astronomical Society for that. Uh, to become a member, we'll post all of that up in the, the Facebook as well. And then, uh, like I say, coming up uh, hopefully next month, um, uh, we could have uh, Richard Hall uh, coming and giving us a chat as well, which would be absolutely amazing. 
Uh, I've been trying to get hold of him to do this for ages. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that would be really, really great. Uh, so thank you all out there. Uh, keep an eye out on our Facebook uh, page, our Facebook group. Uh, I will be posting more uh, when there are clear skies of uh, what you can see. And um, you can, of course, uh, follow uh, Heratina and Sam um, at Milky Way Kiwi uh, or through the, the SLU site as well. Um, so thank you all and uh, yeah, good night. Okay, so.